Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefree. Got a fantastic guest for us today on the episode. Steve Maxwell is a strength coach that travels the world sharing different training methodologies. He's got a fantastic background in grappling, wrestling, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He's one of the first black belts in the United States, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, six Pan American Championships. Uh, the guy's a stud and, and one of the most creative guys uh, that I that I follow. I, I follow his site. Uh, always puts out some unique and crazy things, and I, I like being that guy. I like being that guy with our athletes that always, when they come in, they, they're not, you know, sighing and saying, oh, we got that again. I, I'd rather them come in and say, oh, what the hell's, you know, Coach Matt got for us today, as opposed to the guy just, you know, doing the same thing every time they, they walk in the gym. So, uh, you know, a lot of those things that I do that are unique, yeah, you know, I've, I've stolen from Steve. Uh, great resource for us. Today we get a little bit into, you know, international strength and conditioning. He travels the world. He's in Oslo, Norway today, uh, but travels all over the place. And he's a historian. You know, he really gets into the origins of training. Um, and so we talk a little bit about that, talk about a, a video that he's produced, Conditioning for Grapplers. Um, if you're a wrestling coach or uh, in mixed martial arts, I think it's a must-have. Uh, if you are in team sports, I think it's a it's it's a resource for you to be able to use uh, with your athletes when you're in a, maybe a non-traditional setting. You got an injured athlete off to the side of the field, or um, you know you're in a situation where you don't have a lot of equipment, things like that. But I know you're going to enjoy this episode. He's, he's a great resource, and uh, I really enjoyed talking to him. Before we get started, I want to make sure we recognize Play Sports Performance Forum. Uh, this is one of their latest installs up at Penn State. They're Penn State hockey. Uh, they put in the turf plus the, you know, the, the rolled product, you know, the inlaid platforms. And they're really knocking out some fantastic facilities lately and uh, doing a, a great job everywhere they go. So if you're in the market for flooring right now, reach out to Play Sports Performance. Go like them on Facebook. Go to their website, playusa.com, and, uh, and check them out. Sit back and enjoy this episode. We'll see you on the other side. All right, guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm here with Steve Maxwell, and if you followed Steve at all, it's kind of like playing Where's Waldo. You know, he's, he's all over the world, you know, if it's, if it's Singapore or, or uh, Mexico or all the different places, the United States, or now he's in Oslo, Norway. He's coming to us from Oslo, Norway today. Uh, but he's, he's, he's well-rounded. He's got a ton of great experience, and we're excited to have you on the show and pinned you down today. Hey, well, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it. Uh, Steve, I, uh, I'm go sorry. <laughs> Steve, uh, go, go a little bit into your, your background. How did you get into the profession and then, you know, kind of, um, you know, where, what are you doing now? Well, you know, it, it's interesting how that all came about. When I was a little kid, I used to hear the fathers in the neighborhood complaining about, oh, my God, it's Monday. i got to go back to work, you know. And I, I used to think, wow. Even as a child, what what a horrible thing right. to just like dread going to work on Monday. And I can remember my father telling me, "Hey, look, Steve, find something you really love, because I can't wait to get out of bed to go to work in the morning. Yeah, I love my job." And I was just so blown away by that. You know, here's my pop; he found his love in life. So by the time I was in eighth grade. I already knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a physical education teacher. The guys that really, really uh, uh, I respected a lot and got me really excited were my PE teachers. Sure. And it, it's interesting, too, because my first physical education teacher was a guy by the name of Rick Burkholder, who was in the uh, 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 Trainers Hall of Fame. Yeah, I loved that. His son is the, uh, is the, um, the, uh, the uh, trainer for the Philadelphia Eagles. Wow. His dad was my first gym teacher, okay. and he was the guy that got me really, really interested in becoming a physical educator. That was back when I was 12 years old. Wow. So I was lucky. I knew what I wanted to do in life from a very early age. My gym teachers were the guys that I really respected the most, and you know, I just loved everything about it. Sure, sure. So tell me a little bit about what you're doing now. You're, and obviously, you're traveling the world. You have some certifications and, things, and products and things like that, but what, what would you say yeah, your job is right now? It, you know, I've been I've been doing uh, I've been involved with training for half century, fifty years, and uh, been a professional for forty three years. Had my first job around nineteen seventy, 
uh, just while I was still an undergrad at uh, Westchester University. So, yeah, it was a whole long list of stuff, you know, experiences, uh, working in commercial fitness, teaching physical education in the public school system, wrestling coach, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I really found I really enjoyed working in the adult fitness industry the most. And uh, I had my own dream gym called Maxercise in Philadelphia. And it was the first of many firsts, you know, the first Brazilian jiu-jitsu school in the eastern seaboard, first guy to teach uh, kettlebells. I played around a lot with the high-intensity uh, training protocols, you know, the old hit, yep. uh, you know, the hammer strength stuff. Uh, was actually one of the first guys to get certified in super slow back back in the day. I was real interested in those type of, yeah. those type of protocols and so forth. You know, long list of stuff. But, uh, you know, divorce. <laughs> They'll do uh, interesting things to your life. Absolutely. And uh, I sold the gym and uh, took it out in the road, kind of went underground for a while, working for a pro baseball player as his private uh, conditioning coach out in Arizona. And uh, I moved out of my four-story brownstone house and sold my gym and jiu-jitsu school. And I was living in a camper van like a, like a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved it. I loved the simplicity, you know? Sure. The minimal. It was very liberating, you know? And uh, I, I started uh, getting out there in the, uh, the, the seminar circuit. I realized that, hey, I had a lot of experiences and I've done a lot of stuff. And uh, there's a lot of people that are interested in finding out more about it. So uh, one seminar led to another seminar, which led to another. And before you knew it, I was just traveling full time. Right. I mean, literally, uh, just one thing would just lead to the other. So I got rid of the van, and I pretty much live in hotels and little apartments just wherever I happen to be all over the world. Each week or every two weeks or so, uh, I'll be in a new place, just spreading the word. Sure. Well, you know, probably my first experience overseas was with NFL Europe. You know, I went to Berlin Thunder. I was a strength coach there for a season. Um, really kind of opened my eyes to, uh, you know, strength and conditioning outside of the United States, you know, and then... My wife and I, we adopted three kids from the Ukraine. Uh, I, took in another, right. I took in another child from Honduras. Um, and so in those experiences, in each of those experiences, I would travel you know, while I was there and, and visit training halls and things along those lines. And, and so it's always been intriguing to me, um, you know, the perception of strength and conditioning in the United States, A, but also turn around and then the, you know, the, the perception the United States strength coaches have of strength and conditioning outside of, of this country. Tell me a little bit about your experiences. What are some of the positives you see from you know, strength and conditioning in the United States? And then what are some of the positives you see uh, in strength and conditioning outside of the United States? Well, right now, it seems to be a lot of confusion. People have a real confusion between what constitutes exercise versus recreation. Sure. And they have a huge confusion between demonstrating strength and building strength. People seem to think that almost anything constitutes, you know, proper exercise, but it doesn't. And, you know, anything from, you know, walking the dog to mowing the lawn in their mind is exercise. <laughs> I, I, you know, I look at that as activity. Sure. <laughs> exercise allows you to do those things uh, more easily, you know. Sure. There's a task. And, you know, sure, you know, going out mountain biking or running or kayaking or whatever, I mean, you do get a training effect, but they don't meet the, the, the definition of, of the true exercise. And then you get the other end of it where people are doing all these amazing stunts and, you know, uh, hand balancing and some of this parkour. And, I mean, you know, there's some truly amazing guys out there. You know, you, you see the guys doing the, the, uh, the playground type workouts and so forth. And people don't realize that that is, in my definition, not exercise either. It's, it's basically demonstrating your athleticism and your, your, your ability to do stunts and tricks and right. so forth. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not undermining it. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. But realize that that's not exercise. And I'm seeing the confusion in Europe quite a bit. And there, there seems to be two major things going on here. One... And it's still this way in the States, but to a slightly lesser extent. There's the big box commercial gym, which basically caters to grandma, you know, and, you know, fairly sedentary people. Mm -hmm. You know, they just go in and they put the, on, the headphones on, they kind of lose themselves. 
playing hamster on some type of cardio equipment. Maybe they'll do a exercise group exercise class or a little strength training as an afterthought, mm. which usually consists of sitting in front of the mirror, doing a few curls, a couple presses, maybe some benches. You know, you won't see any real uh, productive type strength stuff going on there, like like you and I know it. Right. And then the other end of it is you get the CrossFitters, which are really confused bunch of guys. You know, don't get me wrong, I'm not against cross training per se. I like to do a lot of different stuff myself, but you know. Trying to compete in exercise is always a step in the wrong direction. Mm. They're, 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 they're getting exercise and sports and competition all confused and, and mixed up a little bit. Basically, what they've done is they've created a sort of a decathlon, but instead of like track and field events, the decathlon events have been replaced with you know, exercise type style events. And you see some pretty horrible things going on there as far as injuries and and, you know, form and technique and all this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, the CrossFit thing is it hit Europe huge. It's extremely popular. Mm -hmm. It's uh, maybe even bigger here in Europe than it may be even in the United States. But that's, you know, it almost seems to be those two extremes. You don't find a lot of moderate, more moderate people in the middle like myself. Right. You know, my, my, my impression from traveling is, is um, you know, scientifically and, and book knowledge, there's some, you know, there's some institutes, you know, English Institute of Sport, Australian Institute of Sport, you know, there's some fantastic research and, and, and um, book knowledge coming out. Um, and then obviously in the United States, we've had a long history of, of practical experiences. And so um, our, our maybe from a coaching and a motivation standpoint, there's some really, really neat things going on. And so I'm just, I'm fascinated by uh, different cultures and the way they approach training. And, and I think it's getting, it's, the lines are blending. We, you know, we talked off camera about the, how, how fantastic technology is. You know, we're talking, you know, Cincinnati, Ohio to Oslo, Norway, and it's, it's getting smaller, the world is getting smaller, but I think it's, um, the strength and conditioning community is getting smaller. So it's, it's fun to see. And I appreciate your comments. You know, Researching you and following you through the years, you, you know, the, one of the things that I admire the most about you is, you know, you're a historian of, of training, you know, I mean, you constantly are researching, not just uh, maybe a, a current philosophy or, or exercise or whatever you want to say, but you, you go back to the roots, you know, whether or not it's uh, Indian culture or, you know, with club, you know, like club training or whatever it is, you know, wh where does that passion come from? What, what, what drives you to kind of research things? back to its origins? What originally got me started in that was I was very much involved with uh, competitive grappling, uh, particularly Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I was one of the first American black belts in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is, as you know, one of the big three for uh, the all-popular MMA these days. Yep. Pretty much if you don't know how to fight in the floor, you don't know how to fight, as they used to say. Sure. So, you know, between wrestling and uh, Jiu-Jitsu, I had a lifetime of grappling behind me. I was always looking for ways to become a better grappler and always researching, always looking for that edge, you might say. And I, I was always curious, what did the mighty men of old do? Right. We know that in ancient times there were some pretty tough guys. And, uh, you know, they didn't even have so much of a Flintstone vitamin uh, as far as supplementation, you know. You know nowadays these guys, uh, you know, like, Dude, it's 10 minutes after my workout. I'm going catabolic. I need my, my, <laughs> my post-workout shaker or I'm going to die, you know. <laughs> and what, what were people doing before technology? Uh, I'm not so sure that technology has even helped us that much when it comes to training. And I mean, for example, I, I just read this paper. It was like 14 pages on all the theories of muscular hypertrophy, what must, makes muscles grow. There's 14 different theories, and it's a theory. No one still knows, right. you know, despite all our so-called uh, you know, medical knowledge and so forth. But so for me, I thought, well, a lot of the modern type of information we can't trust. Who's blood doping? Who's using anabolic steroids? Performance-enhancing drugs? I mean, you just don't know. Right. But for sure, anything prior to 1950 is pure. It's not tainted with any of this stuff. 
And there were some really, really amazing specimens of manhood back in the day. Even physique was. The guys looked amazing. So uh, I looked at the different cultures, especially the wrestling cultures, you know, the Iranians with the Zakhane, the you know, the Hindus where wrestling was virtually a religion, uh, and so forth, looking uh, you know, at these different conditioning systems that the mighty men of old used. And I could be sure that the information was pure. And much of this is still with us to this day, proving that, you know, those valuable things stay with with us, you know? They, they stood the test of time. Right. So right. I've, I've been a big researcher that way. I like to go back historically. What were the fundamentals, you know? Sure. What, 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 what were the basics? And, uh, I mean, if you really look hard at the fitness industry and, and fitness, it almost all had its origins in the martial world, the military world, preparing young men for combat, you know, preparing armies to defend civilization and society. Mm -hmm. And um, almost all innovation started there, for the most part. So when you're going and you're, and you're starting to research these, you know, something that's maybe a new concept to you. I know there's, there's probably there's nothing really new anymore, but you know, but, was, but when there's a you know something that you're on as maybe not as familiar with, what, what's your go-to? I mean, is it a, is it a Google search? Is it a you know going to the local library? What what are the steps that you take to kind of research something out? Well, you know, there's a real knack to. Uh, to doing uh, research online, and you got to be pretty dogged, and you got to look at a lot of arcane stuff. And sometimes the first page isn't the page to go to. You got to get three, four, five pages back sometimes. Right. And there's an awful lot of information out there. And of course, I have visited many, many places. You know, right. I just recently got back from Turkey, where I actually literally participated in a Turkish oil wrestling match. And I was really interested in how these guys trained. Right. You know, it, it was the oldest known uh, athletic festival in the world, continuous athletic festival in the world. Wow. It's also the oldest wrestling tournament in the world. And it goes way back during the time of the Ottoman Empire, you know. And uh, it was really fascinating how they, they uh, came up with this whole concept of wrestling where, where these guys would oil up. And it made perfect sense, you know. Uh, here you have a standing army that's conquered the world. Now they have nothing to do, and you know, boys will be boys. They start getting into trouble, and you, know, right. <laughs> you got to keep these guys occupied. So, what can you do that won't get them hurt? Because you might need your army. Right. Ah, well, you know, you cover yourself with olive oil, and you can extend yourself and grapple as hard as you want. No one's really going to get hurt. You're going to be getting these guys tired and exhausted. What great conditioning for the battlefield. Because right. you, you know you have no clue how long the the uh, the battle is going to last, and of course it's in the sun, and your skin can't breathe or sweat with oil. What a great way to harden yourself to the heat in desert conditions when you're wearing armor. Mm -hmm. So you know it made perfect sense. It looks kind of silly by today's standards, sure. but it, you know everything had a purpose and a place, and it was really fun uh, going in. Uh, uh, it was called the Kirk Pinar, and uh, the buffalo hide wrestling uh, pants that they wear uh, right. weigh almost 12 kilos, about 20 pounds. <laughs> uh, it took about 15 minutes just to wriggle into those things. Yeah, right? That's amazing. Well, one of the, you know, one of the reasons I reached out to you is because I, you know, I got a chance to watch your, you know, your Conditioning for Grapplers DVD or download, you know, instant download, and... Um, you know, I was real impressed. You had, you know, solo drills and partner drills and, and, you know, again, kind of, you know, following you through the years, you know, I, it's almost as if you prefer body weight and kind of non-traditional resistance methods more so than even the, the traditional, you know, barbell and plates, you know, talk, talk a little bit about, you know, the, the motivation behind that, that DVD or that video series, as well as, you know, your uh, experience with, you know, non-traditional body weight type of training. Well, you know, grappling is a form of, uh, of resistance training, and it's, it's pretty, pretty exhausting in itself. No doubt. Uh, supplementary training, it, it's pretty tough. A lot of guys just don't have the time to go to the gym plus go to grappling training. You know, we're, we're talking about guys that are pretty much amateur level and doing it for, for fun. So much better if you just can get it all done in one shot. Mm -hmm. And 
a lot of uh, a lot of times these grappling gyms just don't have the space and or the budget for an extensive uh, weight training facility. So there are many effective things that you can do that have you know been used for literally thousands of years with just your body weight or with a partner's body weight or real simple objects. It doesn't have to be complex, you know. Uh, I've always been into uh, simple, uh, minimalistic approach, just like my lifestyle. Um, and you you can get very, very effective workouts. And they've been used like literally since the time of the ancient Spartans, many of these exercises that I show. And, you know, if anyone doubts the effectiveness of it, all they have to do is just download that video and try a couple of those exercises. I think they'd be quite shocked. No doubt. No, I, uh, you know, I really like the, uh, I mean, there's a ton of exercises. You know, I really like the slosh pipe um, get up. You know, that, was, that was fantastic. We, we're we're going to put that one in. Like wrestling an anaconda. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, I, you know, I was, I was a, you know, a high school wrestler, and so, I, you know, I truly appreciate, you know, the, the concept. And you're right. You know, most coaches, and, you know, this was great about the video and, and, you know, a lot of things that you do is, you know, Throughout, you know, when I when I first got to the University of South Florida as a strength coach, we had a you know we had a nineteen hundred square foot weight room and you know two racks and, and that you know that was it you know but we had a, we had a court you know we had you know, a field you know and so finding ways to train guys get a conditioning effect provide resistance and overload uh, without you know with little to no equipment you know that, that's what really truly defines you as a strength coach whether or not you can survive anybody can do it with the 20,000 square foot weight room and, and all the tools available to you it's when you when you have to be creative and come up with external resistance loads and things along those lines uh it really challenge you to be uh the strength coach that you're going to be and so you know whether it's you you working out on a cruise ship or, or in a park or or whatever it's it's uh you've always well, there's, never, there's never an excuse for not doing it but you bring up a good point because, see, a lot of these high schools, they just don't have the budget. They don't have big weight rooms and so forth, nor do the kids have all that much time. You know, they're crushed with homework. You know, you got a whole room full of wrestlers. You want to strengthen and condition them. Sure, wrestling goes a long way to doing that as far as specific conditioning, but you still need some non-specific type general exercises. What better way to do it than some of these things that uh, have stood the test of time, you know? Even a lot of, like you say, a lot of small colleges, they, they, they don't have the budget. You know, you got a whole room full of young men. You got, you know, you got, or, or in some cases, young women. You got to, uh, you, you have to have some other resources. You have to, yeah, you have to think outside the box. You're not going to have, um, you know, a power rack and barbells for uh, each and every kid. It'd be great if you would. Right. But, you know, if you, you know, rarely is it ever ideal in situations like that. So one of the reasons I created that, you know, that particular videotape was. I just wanted to show people that you don't need all that stuff. You can still get unbelievable workout just with you and your partner and you know, just some very simple implements that you can make yourself for the most part. Sure, sure. You know, you, you, you've been long known for, for you know, mobility. You've written quite a bit about the difference between mobility and flexibility. And, you know, what from, a, from a, a professional or collegiate environment, you know, um, how would you work your mobility drills into not just your training, which is probably easier, but more so like pre-practice or post-practice? You know, you know, you can't, you know, you can't get out there and start doing, you know, upward dogs and downward dogs and and and, and have it really be taken in well. Um, although that may be a great exercise, you know, for for the guys. What what are some things that were, would be go tos for you uh, in a team environment, kind of given? social pressures maybe well i mean of course at the elite level they do almost anything yeah. they've actually i can remember when uh, the lorries brought in their yoga instructor and they were doing yoga with the philadelphia eagles you know yep. the, the big boys will do almost anything to win so there's no problem there social pressures or whatever you know? yeah yeah it's pretty crazy stuff it's usually at the you know NCAA level and maybe the the elite high school level you know where you might get some resistance. The the the, um, the, the thing with mobility is this: I'm seeing that so many of these kids are don't have good movement patterns to begin with, and then as strength coaches, right, we load those poor movement patterns. Mm -hmm. Well, until they can handle their body weight and get these good movement patterns, 
They have no business loading the movement at all. And I see so many kids that can't even do bodyweight squats without inner foot collapse, knees collapsing in, rounded backs and so forth. So that's all part of mobility. Getting these kids with good movement patterns, good basic movement patterns. And then there's a lot of times there's unilateral imbalances. And here we are trying to teach complex sets of skills to guys that have these, these imbalances, uh, right to left or you know, anterior, posterior, I mean, all this stuff. So to my way of thinking, the most important thing you can do is get good movement patterns going. And there's plenty of drills. And you know, they, they don't have to look too strange. <laughs> Right. I mean, there, there's the Russian Kadashnikov biomechanical drills that look pretty wacky. Right. But there's certain good basic movement pattern drills, even just things as simple as, as uh, squats and, and, and prying exercises from the squat position and, and, and uh, so forth. I've been really into this um, vestibular reset patterning recently. I don't know whether you've seen anything. Yeah. And some interesting stuff written about it. You know, I've been, I've been doing crawling you know, since the 1960s as part of my conditioning. I just recognize it as just a fantastic uh, way of resetting the, the nervous system. Right. Because, I mean, let's face it, most, most people sit all day long, even if you work out an hour a day. Do you think one hour of working out can offset 23 hours of sitting? Right. Not really. Right. Your body's going to reflect what you do most. And for most people, that's sitting and laying down, whether it be at the breakfast table, the home office, in the office all day, you know, kids sitting in school all day, their bodies reflect that. Right. And, you know, I'm sure you see it too. Absolutely. Young guys, literally, you know, like tight old men. Uh, it's, it's shocking. Is it any wonder why, you know, uh, the injury rate is, is as high as it is with the amateur sports? You see it a lot. Kids with all sorts of uh, knee, ankle, hip problems and so forth. And uh, if you don't take care of it when you're young, ends up being knee replacement surgery, hip replacement surgery. The U.S. leads the world in those surgeries. By the right, way. right. So, yeah, you know, it all starts when you're when when you're young. It's it's all a matter of getting that mobility. No. And uh, of course, you know, being 60 years old now, the mobility is becoming even more important to me. Right. Well, you're right. That's you know, a lot of people. That's you know, that's the that's the deal. Is is as you age, you're really you're not defined by your chronological age. You're defined by your movement ability. You know, a lot of times, and you know, it's it's a shame. You know, and this is one of the you know one of the primary focuses of, of this show is is to try to make this profession better. And it you know, um, getting strength coaches at the high school level and, and youth sport levels and, and 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 holding on and grasping on to the importance of physical education and, and you know K through twelve. Um, or as a mission for all of us, you know, so that we can maintain health throughout our, our entire life. You know, it's, it's very important. Well, you know, no one ever said that playing competitive sports is healthy. <laughs> sure. And oftentimes it, it's quite injurious. I mean, I know people that, you know, uh, suffered their entire life just from injuries in, in high school sports. But I never believed it should be that way. And uh, most of the, many of those injuries could have been prevented. Mm -hmm. and, you know, movement patterns been looked at carefully and so forth. A lot of times, you know, the, the coaches, but they only have but so much time, have a limited budget. Many of them have very limited training, you know. What are you going to do? Right. It's pretty endemic all, all through. But, you know, each individual can take responsibility and, and, and uh, you know, do some, some work on their own on, on the side. But, uh, you know, back to the issue of mo mobility, I always tell people, you know, look at your mom and your dad and then look at your grandmother and grandfather. You know, both sides of the family. Do you like what you see? Right. Is this where you want to end up? In my particular case, heck no, man. You know, they they were, they, you know, most of my elderly relatives suffered pretty bad, all bound up with arthritis and so forth, you know. Think of, like, just your mother, your father getting up and down off the floor, how difficult that is. Right. You know, just ask the average person over 50. Get down to the floor and get up as quickly as you can. For the most part, they struggle just doing something as simple as getting up and down off the floor. I maintain that that can be prevented. So you know, if you if you really pay a lot of attention to your mobility, that you can move like a child right up until the day you die. Wow. That a lot of what we take uh, as normal in, in aging is not normal at all. 
it seems normal in our society, but it's it's absolutely abnormal. And I've seen some really spry 70, 80 year old. I uh, I studied um, uh, a Russian martial art called Sistema in, in Moscow. And there was this guy, 73 years young, his name is Anatoly. And that guy could punch like a mule kicks. He was a skinny old guy that just had such command of his body. Wow. And I was like, wow, man, this is my new hero, man. This guy <laughs> up and down off the floor and he moved like, like he floated. But see, there's just one example right. you know, of, of like you don't have to end up being a shuffling old man with a walker, you know? Sure, sure. No, I, I, I agree with you 100%. And it's such an important part of our, our profession, you know, that it was something that we need to be stressing to our athletes, um, you know, because you know, at the end of the day, we get into strength and conditioning not just because we want to win games, but we also get in it because we want to make a difference in young people's lives. And what, a, what an important message that is, you know, no doubt. Steve, I know you got to get going, man. Something we always do on the show, you know, we kind of get a little lightning round of, of, you know, some resources for coaches, you know. So give us a quote. I know you, you put some quotes up daily on your website. What, give me a quote that you like to live by or, or have plastered up somewhere. I always uh, believed in uh, high-minded simplicity. It's kind of an excellence of the soul. It can also be described as, like, health of the soul. Okay. And be related to your general physical health and well-being uh, as well. It was basically from uh, Socrates and his uh, description of justice in the Republic. He uh, he compares justice to health, and um, this was used by later by Plutarch to describe the Spartans' high-minded simplicity. And uh, you know it's interesting that all those great philosophers were wrestlers. I don't know whether you know that or not, but they all wrestled. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know. I've always been a minimalist, you know? For sure. Uh, very, very much into, um, simple doesn't always mean uh, uh, non-complex, you know? You, you can have uh, uh, high-mindedness, but you can keep keep the actual uh, uh, choices very simple. No doubt. Well, I, you know, something I always tell my staff quite a bit is that our job isn't to to, to provide the complex, our job is to make the complex simple for our athletes so that they can understand exactly. and use it. You know, and it's, it's such an important quote, yeah. You know, you're, you're often traveling, you got, you know, time to read, you got time to surf the net, you know, you got a presence online. Give, give us a, maybe a, you know, a book recommendation, a, an app, you know, or a website that you, you generally go to, I mean, uh, that, that you like to go and research um, or just unplug a little bit. Yeah. Read Plutarch on Sparta. That'd be a good place to start. Back to the beginnings, back to the origins, and read what he had to say. That was like the seeds and origins of Western civilization. That's the very beginning. Okay. Read that. That will be very interesting for many, many people. That's great. That's great. Is there a, a website that you take when you go online that you go to typically? Uh, nah, I, I, I download tons of stuff uh, I have, my Kindle is just about maxed out <laughs> my, my iPad sure if you just Google any of this stuff it'll, you know a million hits will come up well that's great man well I know you gotta get to your class um, for tonight you, you're giving a, a presentation yeah I gotta tonight. kick some Norwegian butt over here in <laughs> that's awesome I appreciate you coming on the show man sharing lots of tons of, of great information Hey, thanks, Adam. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, the website is maxwellsc.com. That's Maxwell Strength and Conditioning. Yeah, we'll, so, we'll make sure to link up your, your site as well as you know the link for the, the, the video and the rest of your products down below as well. So thanks and a lot, that, Steve. Hey, thanks for the opportunity. Hey guys, before we let you go, I want to take some time and thank Steve Maxwell for coming on the episode. If you could join me in going to ronmckeefrey.com, and click in the comments section and letting him know how much you appreciate his time. I truly appreciate that. While you're there, you can access any of the links that we mentioned in the episode or maxwellsc.com, his personal website, or links to his products, uh, including Conditioning for Grapplers, which is a great product you should definitely check out. While you're there, if you have not signed up for my newsletter, make sure you do so. You get a weekly email with new episodes of Iron Game Chalk Talk and Tribe TV. You also get my free ebook, Weight Room Wisdom, for doing so. 
If you haven't checked out Strength On Demand yet, make sure you go and check Strength On Demand, strength-ondemand.com out. It's an online archive of different strength and conditioning clinic presentations. Gray Cook, uh, Robert Dos Remedios, uh, Matt Bayless, Rob Taylor, on and on and on. Some great strength coaches uh, sharing some, some, some fantastic information. There's over 52 for the year uh, 2013 on there already. Um, starting to, to put stuff up for 2014 here in the near future. And uh, just, a, just a very good resource for, for coaches to continue their education. So if you haven't checked that out, Strength Dash On Demand. And all, as always, I like to hear your comments on how we can make this show better at ronmckeefrey.com. Enjoy your week. We'll see you next week with a new episode. Take care.